Yeah. I'm one of your Syracuse refugees, North American. Um, I have to confess that when I um, entered into the session, I was in unknown territory. I'm a, I was a born a processual archaeologist uh, since the late 1970s when I began my ethno-archaeological research on uh, village pastoralism in Greece. So, you know, um, it's really taken me quite a long time. Uh, I've spent my entire career as a student of, arche of the archaeology of pastoralism. And of course, um, I want to quote my famous professor, Knight, uh, Neville Dyson Hudson, who talked about pastoral nomad nomadism in terms of coincident populations of humans and livestock and the human stock association. And then I'm trying to contrast that with uh, Rosie Bredotti's ideas of um, nomo uh, nomadology, I thought that this would be a fun thing to do, especially for somebody like me, because it would give me this opportunity to say, is there something about the nomadic subject and subjectivity that really can be contrasted in an example of nomadism? And so I was really quite excited about that. Um, I work in the Iron Age in the second half of the first millennium BCE, but I'm going to show you some also some uh, photographs of my earlier work. Um, uh, I, to use um, Adrienne Rich, one of my favorite feminists, uh, um, uh, common uh, metaphor, I felt split at the root. Here was somebody who taught her students feminism, first wave, second wave, even third wave, and yet I did a kind of archaeology that almost erased women. And I hate to admit this, but you know, I'm at the stage of my life when I can do such a thing. <laughs> and um, I, I wanted to talk today about the whole idea of, um, you know, being in this sort of position. And um, I wanted to, I guess I want to show this next slide because it sort of explains a little bit better. So, um, Irene Gedelock does this wonderful way of contrasting Bray Doty's um, 1994 concept of um, uh, nomad um, with um, Donna Haraway's idea of cyborg. And I thought of how you might want to put this together. And I love this Bray Doty idea that the woman is only passing through. And as I heard the earlier talks, I, I also thought about um, uh, Deleuze and Vittari's ideas of women as becoming, and anyone as becoming, you know, a person as becoming. And then she uses this, this is her own quote, uh, quotation, what, uh, get a loss. She, she characterizes Haraway's cyborg as a protean mon um, monster, proving surprisingly adept at shape-shifting herself into use for thinking about identity. And I love that quotation. So beautiful, really, um, and such a great idea. Well, uh, in my field, um, if you look at the latest review that's been done on pastoral nomadism in archaeology by Honeychurch and Makarowitz, uh, you will notice that they give us a very nice definition of um, a commitment to animal husbandry and and mobility, and here you see a wonderful slide in the background. Here's from our work in Kyrgyzstan. We saw these, these uh, guys going up with their sheep and goats um, up to 7,000 feet in elevation. But do they ever talk about gender? Do they even talk about feminism? Oh, no. No, no, no. We don't do that in our work. Um, and so um, I actually have this wonderful critique of my own work by Lucia um, Nixon and Simon Price in 2001, when they were studying pastoral nom um, transhumans in Greece and the Mediterranean. And they said, look, let's go beyond pastoral ecology and economics, and let's talk about gender and division of labor and cultural integration. And they even quote this wonderful paper that my husband and I wrote. Um, and you know, the thing that was so ironic, and here's this lovely picture of me with my daughter, is I recognized that women did all kinds of things in pastoral economies, but I didn't talk about it because I guess <laughs> we didn't want to. We erased that. Now, um, so uh, I want to show you this slide. Um, and this one actually talks 
about um, some of the ethnographic data that uh, exists in our area. And one of, the, um, one of the issues that has really come to light recently in Kazakh and Kyrgyz culture, since the downfall of the Soviet Union, bride stealing has come back into play. And we're going, oh no, why could this happen? And so um, I thought also, I use a lot of ethnographic parallels in my own Iron Age research. Maybe you can't, but I do, because it's the closest thing to understanding what might be going on in Eurasian Iron Age. And um, women do often come from outside. And so because the women come from outside, they also create the ties that nomadic confederacies need over large uh, spatial areas. And um, I spent many years teaching about the TIB and, uh, in Nigeria for this wonderful book by uh, Laura Bohannon, and she always, there's a quote, quotation in this book where she says, women always are trouble, and they cause trouble between uh, brothers and fathers and uncles, and it's for these kinds of reasons. Uh, here's a wonderful slide, um, a picture of um, Saulia Sulemenova's uh, Kellen. Uh, she took a modern graphic of a, of a, um, of a uh, 19th century Kazakh bride, and she made this wonderful sort of poster picture and a lot of Kazakh women uh, supporting her work. Now, there are actually people who have studied the contrast um, between um, what they call nomadology and uh, pastoral studies. Um, and um, I won't read you that slide because it's, it's really boring, but um, you <laughs> might want to look at it yourself. I thought what was really interesting is how Bredotti uses this idea, and she talks about feminism as, uh, a, you know, the woman is kind of an alien, fragmented other, and she, but she doesn't really want to characterize that woman in, in that kind of subordinate position. And um, I also like the idea that she discards humanism and anthropocentrism, and we've heard a lot more about that. Um, my little joke is that I said I'm now dealing with the post-post-structuralist, so I call it composting. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in a session of composting. Um, so uh, here's the example that I wanted to give you from my own research. I, uh, um, I call it reimagining nomadic and cyborg subjectivities in the Iron Age. Um, these are these, uh, this slide here shows a wonderful um, dish we call a tabak um, in uh, Kazakh. It's a shallow serving dish and they're still being used today and in, in, you know, sort of semi, <laughs> not nomadic culture, but in, in, in events. And I've done an earlier paper at an EAA and I talked about how I use Monica Smith's argument about how women usually often manage all of these feasting events and they don't always make the pottery, but they curate the pottery, they produce these serving dishes, they make these elaborate displays of meals. And so they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be relegated to not the big man. So we actually, uh, a student and I, an undergraduate student and I, did an analysis just looking at the diagnostic um, pieces of dishes and um, rim sizes, and we just looked at the diameters of them, and we divided them into three sets of categories. The tabak, which were those shallow dishes I just showed you, and we gave sort of a range of, they were all larger than 19 centimeters in diameter, and then we had a sort of set of medium-sized bowls that we thought were in this range, and then very narrow little kind of cups, almost like little tankards. And we talk about those in terms of the kind of assemblage that really was needed to have to have successful feasting. Um, and then I've been excavating the site forever. If you look in Archaeology Magazine, we're one of the uh, 10 most important discoveries of 2019. It's a completely messy site, but apparently there was an apple seed found there. In Pit House 9, um, I have all of these different contexts um, towards the floors, the different layers of floors, and I have along with them final remains of um, what I think are probably bones that were used um, in feasts. 
And they come along, some of them come along with fragments of pottery. And so um, I, when I did this paper with my student, we talked about how feasting is discussed by Hayden and Villeneuve as building status and privilege, often in terms of big men. And you know, I'm thinking about all the women's labor that is done for the procurement and the production of the tableware and the items that are put on the table. And in Cossack feasts, it's both the women and the young boys that have to serve all those important people. So why is this gendered labor always dismissed? I did another case study. Um, in, um, and this is about Brown versus square houses. I'm so old that I can remember the arguments from Neolithic archaeology, where they talk about round houses being semi-sedentary and square houses <coughs> in the Neolithic being the start of sedentary communities. And I thought that in my Iron Age, I would look at this. And so I have two phases. And in phase one, we tend to get pit houses and semi-subterranean houses. And then in the later phase, we tend to get these rectangular structures. This is a little bit difficult to interpret. You look at this slide and you say, this is not deserved, 2019 archaeology magazine. But <laughs> here you go. That's the outline of a pit house. And this is one of the, and it looks stratigraphically like they're not in the same um, you know, in the right phases that I put them in. So I apologize for that, those of you who are field archaeologists. Now, I wanted to talk also about this, um, this whole parallel that I saw between the round houses and the yurts, <coughs> those pit houses that I was showing you. Um, in Kazakh ethnography, the yurt has kind of an anthropomorphic aspect. These parts, this is the upper part looking towards the sky. These parts are kind of called the skeletal parts. And then it's covered with felt. And this is the most important part. Now, a yurt is put up by a woman. And they tell me you can do it in an hour. Um, I have seen them put up, and I've helped them do it. And I've never been able to do it. You know, we've always taken a lot longer. The only part that is put up by the male is the shine rock which is supposed to be the sacred part, and it opens up to the sky, which they call tengrin. It's also the place from which the cervical vertebrae will be hung down. Um, if a, a child was born in the yurt, they'll slaughter a sacrificial sheep on the day of the birth, and then they hang that cervical vertebrae down as though it were an umbilical uh, cord. So that's an amazing thing. Um, Okay, I'll go fast. So this is the pit house, um, and I want to talk about the Kazakh nomadic sensibility. It, it has a boundless set of relationships between human nature and cosmic forces, and that humans build these worlds and impose them on natural landscapes. In the case of Central Asian nomads, these round, misshapen spheres speak to different subjectivities and identities. And I can't prove what this really means and how you can explain this shift. But I, I just want to say that the whole contrast between uh, nomadic subjectivities and uh, the fact that I study uh, semi-nomads really got me thinking about how uh, there's a whole class of people who are marginal, and yet they make up so much of a landscape and how we can take those sort of subjectivities and put them together. And so, thank you very much. And